This is episode 5 of Amos chapter 3. And here's Amos in the northern kingdom. So we have King Saul and then King David and Solomon united the kingdom. Um, And then when King Solomon died and his son took over, the kingdom split into the north and the south. So here's the northern kingdom went into Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom went into Babylonian captivity. So here is uh, Amos over here. Featuring around this time, just before Hosea, overlapped with Hosea a little, and then they went into captivity. So Amos was active around this time, circa 760, 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the rule of King Uzziah of Judah, who reigned for 52 years. Here's Uzziah here. And Jeroboam II here of Israel, who reigned for 41 years. So the reigns of the two kings overlapped about 15 years. So the north and the south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. So here's a recap of chapter 1. I split it into 1a and 1b. So these were the enemies of Israel that were being judged. And here is the the cousins of Israel were being judged. They are also enemies, but they were blood-related. So so you can pause and read this if you want to recap, otherwise you'll continue. So this is a recap of chapter 2, the judgment on Judah and the judgment on Israel. And this is really where Amos is. He's preaching to Israel. So you can pause and read this, or we'll just continue. So the layout of Amos illustrates the key idea, which is judgment comes. So a primary biblical principle is God judges sin because he's a holy God. And a secondary biblical principle is God will stay his judgment if we truly repent and change our ways. So we did chapter 1, the judgment on his neighbors. Chapter 2, the judgment on God's people. And now we're on chapter 3, the present, which you see we have the present, the past, and the future of Israel. Chapter 3 is the present, uh, the prophet's authority, and the punishment for Israel's sins. So here we are here, chapter 3. And chapter 7, 8, and 9, the five visions of judgment. So let's dive into chapter 3. The authority of the prophet's message. Amos' oracles underscore the certainty of God's judgment on Israel. It will happen. There's no turning back the judgment of God when his repeated offers of grace are spurned. So Israel's presence. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which are brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, Hear this word. The Lord Yahweh now speaks more directly than in previous chapters. He's calling his people to account because of their sins. Pay attention, he says. Something of utmost importance is being relayed. Focus. Chapters 3 and 4 and 5 all start with these three words. Hear this word. Clearly Amos from the southern kingdom was fighting to get his audience from the northern kingdom to pay attention to his warning. They were drifting off. This sheep breeder from the south was challenging the sophisticated north and they snobbishly and stupidly ignored him. Also Amos was getting way too close to home. The North was happy to listen to the destruction of their enemy nations around them and even their sister, Judah, but they didn't want to hear their own condemnation. So Amos had to keep exhorting his audience, come here, listen to me, hear this word, O children of Israel. This is the fond or familial, more possessive title than the usual term, the house of Israel, and against the whole family which are brought up out of Egypt. Against the whole family, usually the, just the northern and southern kingdoms, God granted them special privileges, fought their battles for them, and profoundly blessed them. With these special blessings goes a responsibility to respect their unique relationship. Yet now, both kingdoms have fallen short of the glory of God. Both are apostate to a greater or lesser degree. However, Amos is focused on the family in the north. And God's judgment is initiated on the northern kingdom. They are the first to topple. I brought you out of the land of Egypt. God sees their deliverance from bondage in Egypt as fundamental to being regarded as his family. 
They went into Egypt as a family of 70 people and came out a nation. In God's eyes, they are not two kingdoms, but one family of 12 tribes. This is foundational to his relationship with them. He redeemed them, he protected them, and they belong to him. Yet they are not exempt from justice. Their ingratitude and apostasy only increased the severity of their coming chastisement. As Christians, we also have a relationship responsibility of love and faithfulness because we were purchased and redeemed by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. We were also brought out of slavery, the bondage of sin. So 2 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to the one husband, Jesus, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Revelation 19, then he said to me, the angel said to John, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Verse 2, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. You only, only Israel was in an intimate fellowship with God, underpinned by covenant. As an enlightened nation, living according to God's law, she had a greater responsibility than heathen nations living in darkness. Israel's present strength and prosperity allowed them to feel complacent about their privileged position as the Lord's chosen people. But even the strongest nation will fall swiftly and totally when they abandon God. You only have I known of all. God chose these people. He chose no other. They belong to God via contract. Like a treaty, they are recognized by special covenant. This is, when Israel was a youth, I loved them. In other words, when Israel was a baby nation, I loved them. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And this also, this is from Hosea 11.1. 1. This also means that um, when, when Jesus was a baby and Herod was trying to kill him, um, Joseph and Mary fled to Egypt, taking baby Jesus with them. And so out of Egypt, I called my son. Now God personally... One, gave Israel the Ten Commandments, appeared to her prophets, spoke face to face with Abraham and Moses, and dwelt in her tabernacle. God had a personal and intimate relationship with his family. They were the only nation with whom he had a unique covenantal relationship. And this is by which they will be judged. All the terms of the covenant with the one true God. Therefore I will punish you. If God punishes you, then you know you're a child of God because God, like any caring father, will discipline his own children, if that's any consolation. Hebrews 12, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. I remember my mother often saying as she dug around in the cupboard looking for a strong wooden hanger, spare the rod and spoil the child. Proverbs 13, he, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Notice that when God disciplines unbelievers, he judges based on natural law. That which we intuitively know is evil behavior. For example, lying, stealing, cheating, raping, and murdering, and taxes. And God's judgment on the heathen nations was brief. I will send fire. Is what he said, plain and simple. So we have a covenant relationship with God. And here's the people in the desert uh, when, when Moses said, these are the blessings of God. They said, yep, those sound good. And he said, but if you're bad, these are the curses of God. And they said, yeah, amen, so be it. But of course, uh, Isaiah covenant was a tough one to keep for them. Israel is queried. Israel occupied a place of privilege with God, which meant God had higher expectations of holy behavior from them. Therefore, the Lord's indictment of his chosen is detailed and unsparing. They would be judged more strictly than other nations because they knew better. They knew the law and the prophets. Israel is shockingly reminded, just like her enemies, she too will be punished for her sins. Now Amos presents a series of seven rhetorical questions using events drawn from daily life where the expected answer to the question is mostly a presumed no. The questions compare cause and effect. They imply causality that nothing is by chance. The Lord has spoken and the effect or outcome is certain. So verse 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? 
can two walk together? Will two random travelers share food equitably if they have never met before? Probably not, unless they are agreed. Abraham and Isaac walked up the mountain in agreement, and that's Isaac being his son. If they were not, then Isaac would have refused to go to his anticipated death, because Isaac knew that they had all the makings for a sacrifice, but no lamb for the burnt offering. Yet Isaac allowed his father to bind him. Scholars say that Isaac was not a child, but an adult who could have easily withstood his father, but he didn't. They were in communion together. Similarly, and then God provided a ram so he didn't have to kill his son. Similarly, Israel and God were in covenant. They agreed on the terms of their walk together. However, remember they did that here. They agreed on the terms of their walk together. However, Amos is saying that God can no longer walk with Israel because they are no longer in holy agreement. Their walk has diverged. Verse 4. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out in his den if he's caught nothing? Will a lion roar? A lion roars triumphantly when he captures his prey. While the lion stalks, he's silent. He only growls when he has already captured his prey, not before, else the animal is forewarned. Isaiah 5. Their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. They will carry it away safely and no one will deliver. Amos says the lion has found its prey, Israel, and is poised to pounce. The Lord is ready to do what he warned he would do. While the threat is imminent, some can still escape. But once judgment starts, it's too late. The lion has pounced. As an aside, the Bible says that King David killed a lion with his bare hands. So we know that lions inhabited the land up until about 80 AD when the Romans started rounding them up and shipping them to Italy for gladiator sports in the Roman Colosseum. So they did them a favor. They cleared out the lions. Verse 5. Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there's no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? Fall into a snare. A bird won't fly into a snare for no reason. The snare must have been baited. Israel has been baited and trapped by her sin and have fallen into the snare of apostasy. Will a snare spring up from the earth? A trap won't be sprung unless it has caught something. Because of their many iniquities, the trap of sin has caught Israel and they have fallen into God's snare of judgment. Third step. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? If a trumpet is blown. In ancient times, a person was given the responsibility of watchman. He walked the walls of the city, and if he saw anything untoward approaching, like an army, then his job was to blow the trumpet and alert the city. Amos is their trumpet. Will not the people be afraid? Israel ought to be trembling with fear at their coming calamity. But their selected priests, basically all false prophets, are assuring them that they are God's chosen. No disaster would come upon them. So they ignore Amos, which is an appointed priest as opposed to their selected priest. So they ignore Amos. They ignored his warning, trumpet, blast. If there is calamity in a city, the people would not accept that God could or would bring disaster upon Israel. It was unthinkable. Their knee-jerk reaction was, Never. God would never do that. Yet Amos makes it very clear that their smug assumptions are wrong. This coming calamity is from Yahweh, the Lord God himself. Jehovah will orchestrate their demise. And the proof of it is, he's done it before and will do it again. Verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. The Lord God does nothing unless he reveals. God is a just God. He never just wipes out an unsuspecting nation or individual. He always first sends his prophets to warn the people. This gives them time to repent and mend their ways. However, if they don't turn from their sin, then judgment is inevitable. Secret. Unless he reveals his secret. Secret. The Hebrew word is interpreted to mean a secret told by whispering to another while sitting close together. 
Many people think keeping a secret is telling one person at a time. Reveals to his uh, reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. God doesn't tell everybody. He tells his prophets, and his prophets tell everybody. God selects and anoints his prophets. They're not self-appointed like the priests of the north. 2 Peter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, a lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? A lion has roared. This echoes Amos chapter 1, where Amos the shepherd ominously warns that he heard a lion roar, and it's none other than the Lord himself. Their coming punishment is coming. It's no longer just a possibility. The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Amos prophesies because God has spoken. He can do nothing else. He must speak. Silence is not an option. He has divine compulsion to prophesy. God's prophets always speak truth. If they speak as the one true God commands, they are always right. Israel cannot avoid their fate. The lion has roared. Punishment for Israel's sins. Now Amos takes aim at the wicked elite of Israel, whose unholy greed is deeply offensive to God. God scoffs at the fortifications that Israel has built that will not withstand the Assyrians, God's weapon of choice. Verse 9. Proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod, that's the Philistine, Philistine city, and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. See great tumults in her midst and the oppressed within her. The palaces of Ashdod and the palaces of Egypt. The morals of Israel, supposedly a godly nation, are worse than so-called heathen nations. In fact, their iniquities are so disgusting that they astonished even the, th the heathens. The rich and powerful profited from depraved greed. They also spurned even the basic justice required for orphans and widows whose sons were taken in slavery to pay off non-existent debts. This was anathema to God's laws. For all indictments of crimes, two witnesses are required, and the two that God selected of pagan nations, Ashdod and Egypt. And worse, they are Israel's enemies. And why are Ashdod and Egypt the expert witnesses? Because for millennia they have been doing exactly what Israel is now accused of, paganism, witchcraft and occult practices. Israel would have known that if God called two witnesses, then they were facing total annihilation because it's in God's word. Number 35. Whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses, two or more. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. God called two witnesses, even albeit pagan nations, because if Israel does not repent, it's the death penalty. Assemble on the mountains. Here's the mountains, here's Samaria. The heathen nations are summoned to stand on the mountains where they will get a good view. There they can testify to Israel's sins and bear witness to the Lord's indictment against her. The mountains of Samaria. Samaria was the capital city of the north, and it's where the rich stored all their ill-gotten gains and housed their slaves. Great tumult in her midst and the oppressed within her. There was no law and order in Samaria. The judges were corrupt and could easily be bribed to find in favor of the rich. There was violence in the streets, perpetrated by the wealthy, condoning robberies against their own populations. The citizenry was shamefully oppressed by their leaders and being used as cheap labor. When the rich rob the poor, it's called business. When the poor fight back, it's called violence, according to Mark Twain. Today, populations are robbed via taxes. Property tax, income tax, gas tax, capital gains tax, inheritance tax, and so much more. And most insulting is the New World Order wish tax, with that they wish to impose of the fake Green Deal and a tax for the total hoax, climate change. Verse 10. For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. 
they do not know to do right. Amos points out that Israel is so far gone that they don't know how to do right any longer. They've abandoned the law of Moses and its knowledge. Consequently, their moral compass is way out of whack. Hosea 4 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of God, I also will forget your children. That's the crux of the matter. They have forgotten God's laws and substituted it with man-made doctrine. Proverbs 10, ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. And Israel has been given a death sentence. Who store up? The present prosperity of Israel is based on greed. The already obscenely rich got even richer from robbery and oppression of the poor, the weak and the needy. Plus their man-made laws allowed all indulgences, all depravities, all iniquities. Nothing was forbidden. So a violence and robbery in their palaces. There's a vast discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots. And this offended God. The wealthy lived in palaces, yet they violently took the sandals and cloaks of the poor as collateral for paltry debt. And they piled up their robbery spoils in a safe place. They guarded palaces. Verse 11. Therefore thus says the Lord God, An adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. An adversary. God has been warning his people for a hundred years. He sent many prophets to the northern kingdom. Elijah, Elisha, Jonah, Amos, and Hosea. And the north had a full array of God prophets warning them to turn back from their wicked ways. As Dr. Chuck Missler says, one is not a horse thief because he steals a horse. He steals a horse because he is a horse thief. So here was the, from the very first page that I did up front, page number one, are the prophets in the north before they go into Syrian captivity. Here's Amos. And Jonah, although we know him as, as preaching to Nineveh, he was a, a respected prophet in Israel. And Ob Obadiah preached against Edom, but was also a, a prophet in the, in the north. So God kept sending them prophets, including, like I say, Elijah and Elijah, and they kept ignoring them. And the north had a full array of their prophets. He shall sap your strength from you and your palaces be plundered. He shall sap your strength. God used a pagan nation as his judgment tool. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians came and that looted Samaria and took all the people into captivity. Israel had been at the zenith of its power, yet the north ceased to exist within just 40 years. Their prosperity had made them a tempting target, and without God's protection, they fell fast. Your palaces shall be plundered. The rich robbed the downtrodden and greedily stored the loot in their palatial homes. Now God says, an enemy will come and take it all away. The rich plundered the poor, now their rich palaces will be plundered. God turned away, and now Israel faces his curses. Verse 12, thus says the Lord, As a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria, in the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. As a shepherd takes two legs or a piece of an ear, so the mutilated remains will be proof enough that the sheep was taken by a wild animal and not stolen. Amos was a sheep reader and shepherd, so he would know the law. If the herdsman could provide evidence of a wild beast attack, then the herdsman was not responsible for the death of the lost sheep. Otherwise, he had to pay damages to the owner. Exodus 22. If it, the animal, is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence and he shall not make good what was torn. doesn't have to pay for it. When Israel is torn to pieces by Assyria, Amos' presence is evidence that he has done what he could to warn the nation, so God will not hold him responsible. Even if Amos can only save one or two people, two legs and an ear, he has done as much as he was able to for this unheeding people. So shall the children of Israel be taken out. The Assyrian invasion 
will be like the attack of a wild animal, and only a sad remnant will survive the destruction. The nation would be ripped apart and widely dispersed by the Assyrians. And the diaspora today is returning to Israel from Europe, Asia, the Americas, and Africa. In the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch, the wealthy of Samaria will be lazily chatting or reclining on cushions laid out for their comfort on beautiful mosaic inlaid floors or snacking and lounging on a couch when the Assyrians suddenly swoop in and overwhelm the city. The rich did not prepare because they didn't believe Amos or any of God's other prophets. They will huddle under cushions in the corner of their bed or hide behind couches, but the rich will be dragged out to slavery just as they themselves had unjustly dragged the poor and needy into slavery. God's legal beast. Amos now addresses Israel as though presenting a legal beast as he explains the legality of what God is about to do from the standpoint of the duties and responsibilities of a shepherd. The father obligates himself to the terms of the covenant that was earlier sworn, just as he expects Israel to do. The legal basis comes from the Torah instructions of the shepherd and the sheep for which he is legally responsible. Shepherds only sometimes own the sheep they tended. More often than not, they just work for the sheep owner. Now the Torah states that the shepherd must provide evidence of an animal attack in order to be exonerated from damages for any loss. In this metaphor, God is the shepherd. It's not his fault that the sheep, Israel, are lost. They have free will. And God's evidence is over 100 years of prophets he sent to warn them. God is shown as switching roles over Israel, from the shepherd protector to the lion attacker that hunts them down, tears the nation apart, and devours them. God is legally absolving himself of Israel's destruction. All the legal requirements are set down in the Torah and are being met. And Israel needs to understand what is happening to them and why it's happening. The focus now changes from Israel's social injustices to the severe faults in their worship practice and rituals. God will punish the altars of Bethel, their worship. Verse 13. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts. Hear and testify. God again addresses Israel's surrounding enemies to watch God's judgment on the rich and powerful in Samaria. These pagan nations are to testify that the Lord's indictment against his chosen is true and well-deserved. Testify against the house of Jacob. Jacob typically refers to all 12 tribes of Israel, the north and the south. However, after Jacob wrestled with the angel all night, God renamed him Israel. Here God is using Jacob to infer only Israel, the northern kingdom. So I have a statement here on the ten tribes of Israel. So here we have the kingdom of Judah, and the kingdom of Israel, which overlaps into the, to the other side of the river Jordan. And people always talk about the lost tribes of Israel. But Judah, the southern kingdom, was made up of three tribes, Benjamin, Judah, and Simeon. So the twelve tribes that you believe, nine in the north. And then the Levites never actually got any tribal land allotment. Instead, they were scattered among the tribes so that each tribe had a spiritual center. Thus the Levites were in both Israel and Judah, which leaves eight tribes in the north, if you want to put it that way. So when King Jeroboam instigated his man-made pagan religion, many faithful people of the northern tribes moved south to Jerusalem to worship the one true God, and presumably the idolaters moved north, resulting in the mix of tribes. So here's Jerusalem and the southern, uh, southern kingdom, and here's Israel, the northern kingdom. So now they, they're mixing back and forth. So then here's the Assyrian Empire. And they came in and they took Israel, the kingdom of Israel, off into, uh, into their own land. And so Israel was gone. And then a few decades later, Babylon overran Assyria. Many of the Jews were freed from captivity in Assyria and returned to their ancestral homelands. And when the Persians overran Babylon, more returned to Israel. Thus, over time, the north and south were a mix of all 12 tribes. There are no lost tribes of Israel. They became commingled. So don't confuse the ge geographical territories 
of the north and the south, but the ethnic people, the Jews. Says the Lord God, the God of hosts. Note that the term Lord with a little L was a generic Canaanite term for Baal. When you angered a god, it was important to distinguish which of the many gods was calling them out. Amos makes it very clear that God identifies himself by the name Yahweh, Yehovah. It's the one true God who is commanding their attention. None of their lots of little gods. In this book of Amos, there are multiple variants that Amos applies to the name of God. In chapters, all these different chapters, he had Yahweh, Lord God, Yahweh, Lord God of hosts, Yahweh, Lord God of hosts, the Lord, the Lord whose name is God of hosts, Lord God of hosts, and Lord your God. So notice sometimes it's a little, little letters, and sometimes it's all caps. And usually when we see all caps, then we're reading about God wearing his judgment hat. So you'll see that a lot. The little L, maybe mercy and grace, and the big one is judgment. So here are some unique names, names of God. Yahweh, Yehovah, El Shaddai, uh, Elohim, El Elyon, etc. Fascinating. Verse 14. That in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. That in the day that I punish, this means that God's punishment is not immediate. God is still giving Israel a grace period in order to repent, and mend her ways, and turn back to the one true God. 2 Chronicles 7. God speaking to Solomon, he says, and I put these numbers in here. God said to Solomon, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith, make, have a relationship, in other words, with God, and turn from their wicked ways, mend their sin, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So it's not enough to just humble yourself and say, oops, I'm really sorry, and pray and say, you know, our Father. And then but you have to also seek his faith create a relationship with God, and turn from your wicked ways. So don't go out from Sunday, repent, and on Monday, do it again. So notice that God will punish the nations, but destroy the pagan altar. So he says, this day I will punish Israel, but I will visit destruction on Bethel. That's an interesting distinction, although they both landed up destroyed. Punish Israel for her transgressions. There hasn't been simply a sin here or there. No, Israel's sins have been piling up over the decades. Their moral and ethical foundation has eroded to the point where God finally intervenes. God uses the natural process of strong nations displacing weaker ones. Note God punishes nations immediately, but individuals wait until Judgment Day when they stand before the great white throne of God. The altars of Bethel. When the north splits on David's United Kingdom, King Jeroboam I wanted to deter his people from worshipping in the south. Consequently, he set up two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan. Then he selected his priests. He selected the priests and created his own man-made religion. This king alone was responsible for leading Israel into apostasy. Altars in God's Torah serve two functions. One, as a place of ritual sacrifice and two, as a place of asylum. So Exodus 21 says, He who strikes a man so that he dies shall be surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie and wait, but God delivered him into his hand, in other words, it was accidental, he will pass, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And God provided six cities in the land. Here they are here. Hebron, Shechem, Kadesh, Golan, Ramesh Gilead, and Bezer. Uh, God provided six cities, three this side of the Jordan, three that side of the Jordan, to which a person could flee until his case was determined. This eliminated the chance of mob rule and or kangaroo courts from taking over. One Kings explains the coup for David's throne. So Adonijah was the brother of Solomon and he felt he should be king. And so he had a big party. Everybody was saying, you know, uh, 
hail King Adonijah. And when Solomon heard about it, he came after him. So this was a, a coup that Adonijah was attempting. You can read all about the whole story over in 1 Kings 1. So now Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. So he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon saying, Indeed, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon. For look, he's taken hold of the horns of the altar saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with a sword. You know, he turned out to be such a traitor, eventually Solomon has to take him out. The horns of the altar shall be cut off. When a man was condemned, if he managed to run into the temple and grasp the horns of the altar, he could claim protection. But now the horns will be cut off. No altar means no sanctuary, no atonement of sin, and no horns for asylum or immunity from prosecution. But anyway, God doesn't recognize their altars as valid. Why? Because of their location in Bethel, the site of the golden calf idol. God says these horns of refuge will no longer save Israel because they are illegitimate. The nation broke God's law. The nation broke God's law and must face punishment for that. Again, God is precisely following the terms of the covenant. God never deviates from it. All the rules are here. Leviticus 26, I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. The book of Amos is a stinging rebuke of a nation that has rejected and forgotten God. Since we in America today know our Bibles, and since God does not deviate from his word, this does not bode well for us in the future. Verse 15. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Destroy the winter and summer house. While the poor often lived in the fields under the stars, the wealthy had two homes depending on the season. Their grand homes and lavish palaces and the decadent lifestyles that the rich enjoyed will be no more, says the Lord. Houses of ivory. Ivory was enormously expensive, and it still is today. The rich had beautiful carvings in ivory and furniture exquisitely inlaid with ivory. God says their treasures and opulence will be destroyed. And the tragedy is, it all came true wonder how many elephants had to give up their lives to make that pretty table. So episode 5, this is the end of it. Chapter 3, a prophet's authority. So prophets point the way. So Daniel was tossed. You know, the prophets in the Bible had a really tough time. I mean, Daniel was tossed in the lion's den. <laughs> prophets would preach to the kings, and if the kings didn't like what they were saying, they just killed him. Isaiah kept telling the king some home truths until eventually he was the king had him stuck they they cut open a a, a a tree and they carved out the inside put him inside and then screwed it shut and there he was stuck inside of this tree and then when he still kept bugging them they sawed the tree in half which means they sawed the prophet in half i mean they really had a tough time amos himself he's a rich man is a well. He's at least a very comfortably uh, comfortable man in the south. He goes to the north, and they basically ignore him and spit on him. And Jeremiah, I mean, I cried all the way through Jeremiah the first time I read it because you know he was just a kid, and when he was like fourteen, he was a teenager. God said, "Okay, I want you to go and prophesy," and he said, "God, I'm just a kid." God said, "No problem, I've got your back." And so Jeremiah goes off to to prophesy and tell them that you know things are you. If you, you're a bad nation and things are going to get you. And they throw him in a cistern at one point. And a cistern back in the day, they were huge things like a swimming pool almost with a little opening. But there was all mud in the bottom from, you know, years of filling it up with water. And so there he could only stand. He couldn't sit. He couldn't lie down. And so he stood in this muck and mud for days until somebody came to get him out. And they were so worried about how he might his body might have been softened by the muck that they didn't just pull him out of the cistern. They actually put down towels and stuff that he could put it under him and they could lift him out very gently. 
And then they still didn't let him go. They threw him in jail after that. He got whipped. He got put into stocks. I mean, Jeremiah, I cried all the way through Jeremiah. It just uh, When you were a prophet of God, that did not mean that things were going to be hunky-dory for you. Because, you know, you were talking to the priests and the leaders of the nations. Uh, you weren't talking to the guy next door. And so you were not, generally not well received because generally you weren't saying, wow, God's really happy with you. He's going to bless you, bless you. So, yeah, the prophets point the way. And the authority, man, they did not have it good. So you can pause and look at some of these names of, of God. I mean, I am Adonai, the Messiah, the El Shaddai, Elohim. I mean, this just wonderful. This is just beautiful, all the names of God. You can pause and read this, Abba, Father. But before you go, let me bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Please join me for the next one, episode 6, chapter 4. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Shalom. <laughs>